I'm Clarice, and you're about to watch Probable Cause. How was that for an intro? Dan Greider, Probable Cause. It is May 26, 2024. And of course, tomorrow is Memorial Day, May 27th, 2024. And I hope that you'll stop and take just a moment to remember those that have gone on before us and given the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms. Regardless of our political stances and where you may be, doesn't really matter. We are all Americans. I got this information from the White House front page here. I'm not sure who wrote it or what the stance was, but I think it's exactly accurate and I'm going to use it. Doesn't really matter who's in the White House or anything like that. This has to do with those that have gone on ahead of us. If you hear that sound here, that's the sound of the droning of the DC-3 engines. Listen to this. And that sound is basically a B natural, a note, but not quite. It took me a little while to figure it out, so I took these finger picks and that guitar and I laid down a Memorial Day track that I'm going to include here now. As I do that, I'm going to read from the White House here, their front page here, and here's what it says. To all those grieving the loss of a loved one who wore the uniform, including our Gold Star families, and to all those who have loved one still missing or unaccounted for, our country sees you and mourns with you. I know how painful this day can be, how it can bring you back to the day when you lost a piece of your soul. It is overwhelming. No words can ease that grief. But I hope you'll find a small measure of solace in knowing that we will never forget the price your loved one paid for our freedom. And we will never stop trying to repay the debt of gratitude we owe you and them. And that is our vow today. And that is our vow always. May God bless our fallen heroes. May God bring comfort to their families. May God protect our troops. America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Welcome, it's Sunday night. I'm glad to have you with us here this evening. If you're checking in in the live chat room, let me know where you're checking in from. And uh, we got a full episode here this evening. Let's take a moment tomorrow and remember Americans. You know, a few years ago, some of you may know this, I've spoken a little bit about it. My wife died from cancer in 2011. I did this special award because my son Dylan started sixth grade the fall after his mother had died. So we started this award. I didn't know it, but Dylan was the recipient of an award that year for perfect attendance in straight A, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Those were the first three years of us together missing mom. So we did this, and 10 years ago right now, Dylan walked across the stage and was the first recipient of the Darla Grider Highest Achievement Award, an award given to any student who could achieve perfect attendance and straight A for all three years. Just a few nights ago, Dylan was the person, the MC in charge of handing out that same award that he received 10 years ago. I'm kind of proud of the kid. Here's a very short snippet from graduation just a few nights ago where we gave out the Darla Grider Highest Achievement Award. As I mentioned, uh, my youngest son, the very first recipient of this, and he is here tonight, he is going to hand out these awards, um, and he made it through. All I have to say is that if he did it, you guys can do it, because Dylan really He's not that bright, okay? <laughs> Tonight, to hand out the Darla Grider Highest Award of Achievement, my son, Bill Grider. Good evening. Good evening. 
right, so here, the first recipient of tonight's Garland Ryder Ice Achieve Award, Trey Wall. Wasn't that cool? I appreciate you hanging in and watching. You know, some of you have followed along and know our story, know who we are, and I appreciate that. We're trying to get everything done here. I got this DC3 video that came out really, really good. It's going to come out Tuesday night on the Facebook page, AQP and Coffee. If you're not on AQP and Coffee, it's free. Turn in your membership to AQP and Coffee. It's a Facebook page all about AQP and conversation and talking about AQP for general aviation. That video will come out Tuesday night on AQP and Coffee, and then it'll become public on Wednesday night. If you want to see it a full day early, it'll be on the Facebook page uh, under a private link where you can watch it there. The video has some amazing CRM concepts in it, and I'll be the first to admit I learned something off of this. I went out and fly with uh, two people. I went out to fly the DC-3 with two people, boyfriend and girlfriend, and they flew the DC-3. The guy already was um, extremely accomplished, um, but what I learned on this thing, if, if you'll watch this video, there's a ton of takeaways and some previous incorrect misperceptions that I had about what was going on specifically with communications in the traffic pattern, and a big lesson that I learned that I'm gonna include in this thing, um, it's not the fact that we can't communicate. It's the fact that when we're communicating, whoever is out there on the ground may not be hearing us. And that was the situation here. Huge takeaway on this thing, but a beautiful video. Comes out Tuesday night on AQP and Coffee. Comes out Wednesday night right here on Probable Cause. It won't be a live thing or anything like that. It'll just come out about 9.30 p.m. on Wednesday night. I hope that you'll watch it. I hope you'll critique it. I deserve a tremendous amount of critique for that video. I already see lots of things that we could have done better, and I see lots of room for improvement, and that is the beauty of YouTube and public comment. Uh, Roger, and uh, we're going to use it all. We'll be clearing at the far end. All right, we'll slow it down, Edeka Baker. All right, why don't you set? Boost pumps are on. Flaps are half. Your red over red, so hold the nose up a little bit. Yeah. There you go. There's your red over white. I'm going to give you full flaps and final lineups here. Like you said, boost pumps are on. Flaps are now full. Your traffic is touching down right about now. Clarice. Can you hear the lamps, Clarice? Uh. You're looking good. All right, put your hands on the throttles right here. There you go. I'm going to talk you through this. We're going to do this together. You stay right on those throttles. Great. They're, they're kind of hard to move, but when we get down here close, we're just going to gently close the throttles at the same time we push forward on the yoke. I'll help you. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> Two zero. Keep it coming. 
final gear check is good. To the bottom part of the pedals. Northeast, straight down, runway is clear. Now ease the power back, nice and slow. Beautiful, just hold it. Very nice, just hold it. Oh wow, you got it, you got it. Just hold it, hold it right there. This tire is going to slide on here. Oh, oh you got to be kidding me. All right, now close them all the way. Good. Flaps are coming up. That is sick. <laughs> that is mine. That. Did you hear the tires? They just kind of slid. That wasn't even a chirp. That wasn't even a chirp. All right, I got the airplane, Clarice. All right. I got it. Nice job. How about that, huh? There you go. Oh, my first tailwheel landing. Is it really? Do it. <laughs> wow. We're doing good in general aviation. I'm going to go over a little bit of data, but let's put this on the screen here. So far, we are at 9.12 fatals per month. For this year, that's 2024 versus 12.70 for 2023. So we're quite a bit ahead. So far, we've had 44 fatals in America uh, since January 1 of this year. That's compared to 61 fatals one year ago right now for the tame, same time period. I want to go over, um, work over the list and all the accidents and specifically the things in May. We'll get to that here in a little bit. But most importantly, I want to show you this video clip. This is from the NTSB data. January 12th to 2012, all the way through 2023, which is 12 years of data, how many accidents, generally based accidents, has the NTSB investigated? Well, the answer is 13,699 investigations. Each investigation takes a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of paperwork. 13,699 of them in the last 12 years. How many recommendations has the NTSB done? Well, here's the answer. Follow along on the screen here. I'll show it to you as I do this. You can do the same thing yourself on the NTSB Carroll website. A total of 19 recommendations. That's all in 13,699 accident investigations. We've only got 19 recommendations. Yes, I beat up on the NTSB real hard. Their reports are not timely, they're often inaccurate, and they're not producing recommendations. That has generated a tremendous amount of hate from the NTSB, and I'm going to go into a little bit of that. There's some retaliation going on. I'm going to address that specifically very quickly before we get into the next section here, which has to do with accidents. Is the NTSB and the FAA capable of harassment and retaliation? Of course they are. I am making them look bad on occasion. And it's not necessarily me that's making them look bad. They're just doing a bad job. It's not their fault. They're not qualified to be doing what they're doing in the most part here. And boy, do they hate me. Yes, they hate me. Take a look at this next section. Now, where this all comes from, I believe, is from a accident that occurred right here in Atlanta, not very far from me. Two African-American women out doing time building had an engine failure at night and they managed to dead stick their airplane into a forest and they both survived. I don't know if you remember that interview. I went and interviewed them. I did not solicit them. They called me. They told me the story and I went and interviewed them. I thought it was a fantastic story. My point was in the time of crisis, they did not stall their airplane. I didn't get into what caused the engine failure. Um, initially, the news report said that they ran out of gas. They were adamant that they had plenty of fuel. Turns off, one of the fuel caps flew off the airplane after takeoff at night, and I don't think that they noticed. But I went to their place and interviewed them. We made a fantastic video, a very positive video about their handling, their airmanship of the aircraft. They did not stall the airplane. They flew that airplane into the top of the trees, and they both survived, and they're both fine. After I produced that video, apparently the FAA was upset because I got the interview and I was there before them. The two individuals, due to their medical condition and the fact that they were still on pain medications, they neglected to call or offer statement to the FAA or NTSB for some time, which is, in my opinion, totally fair. But I got a call from the FAA. This is an actual FISDO guy. Um, I've had quite a few calls from uh, FISDO. I record them all. I got quite a bank of stuff here. This particular physical guy is actually, I believe, a pretty good guy. But look on the screen here. Here's what he said. He told me that you got the wrong person flying the airplane and all kinds of stuff. And it's probably going to create some hassle when it, comes, when it comes down. So don't be surprised if they don't come back after you. Well, if they don't come back after you, that's retaliation. I didn't do anything wrong. I interviewed them. I talked about what they did and I talked about their airmanship. Here's what else he said. I'm trying to stifle some other stuff in the office and the NTSB about you interfering with an accident investigation. This is NTSB. 
This is FAA and NTSB inter wanting to accuse me of interfering with their investigation. I didn't in interfere. I didn't cause the accident. I interviewed them and showed very clearly that they did a very nice job. And that's all that I have to say. Now, this particular, this next individual from FISDA that called me, um, he wanted to talk about several factors here. We talked about the VMC demo. I want to put this on the screen here. And I, this is a, the body of an email. And I'm, I'm trying to explain to him our topic has to do with the VMC demo for multi. Here's my writing in black. The aerodynamic requirement to block one rudder so the plane does uh, lose its directional control before stalling is not an approved technique. And there's no industry guidance or AFM information on how to do this or approval to do it. Intentionally blocking a flight control in flight for the purpose in flight is both illegal and unsafe. We cannot block flight controls in flight. His answer, I will refer this to the FAA training and certification group so they can weigh in on the technique and practices that you are discussing. Well, yes, we, we need to talk about that. Here's another thing that uh, that we exchanged. This is me, my writing in black letters here. I also asked about the Bonanza trainers, the BPPP that intentionally pop a door open during training immediately after takeoff. This is their training syllabus. Is this unsafe or legal? His answer was, please send me a reference to the training syllabus you're referring to as I have not seen or heard anything about this. My point is there's all kinds of flight training things that we do that aren't necessarily in the manual that you can do. They're just not in the limitations that say that you can't do it. Now, we went on to talk about shutting an engine down in flight, which according to him, anytime you shut an engine down in flight, you're creating an emergency. Not true. If you look in the ACS for the multi-engine, an in-flight engine shutdown is required. No place in the regulations or ACS or anything like that, uh, no place regulatory anyway. Remember, the ACS is not regulatory. That's only for check rides. No place does it ever say what you can and can't do. There's no airplane limitation on anything you do. Remember, your glider pilots, when they make a takeoff in a glider for a, a glider check ride, they have to do a rope break at 200 feet. They're going to intentionally chop the rope at 200 feet, and that's part of their maneuvers. Are they creating an undue unnecessary emergency? I think not. I think that's an excellent scenario. I think that's why glider pilots are better than us. They go through this kind of thing. Shutting down an engine in flight is an FAA requirement. Doesn't really matter what altitude you are. If you can do it safely is the bottom line. Is it against any particular aircraft limitation? No, it's not. There's also something that he mentioned in the Piper flight manual about never doing an intentional in-flight shutdown below 5,000 AGL. I think it states that that simulated engine failure should not occur less than 5,000 feet above the above the terrain. That does not include actually shutting down an engine uh, because in that situation, when you actually you're shutting down an engine you are potentially creating an emergency situation. Next, in the body of this email that I just recently got back from him, I had written him like three emails and he never responded. I finally pinned him down to responding to my email and he finally wrote this back. He has sent me two different LOIs concerning the operation of the DC-3. So this is my question to him. He's already admitted on the phone that he's closed these out. He says, we, I said to him, we also discussed single pilot operations of the DC-3. You have indicated an open LOI and yet now recently on the phone, you have told me that you have closed it out. I wonder why you would initiate this action without knowing what you are talking about. His answer, the LOI is required to be sent in accordance with the Pilot's Bill of Rights anytime the FAA investigates you. The LOI provides you with notification of the investigation and opportunity to provide a statement if you desire to do so. If you receive the mail letter after our conversation the other day, that is a result of the mail being delayed. As stated in our call, the complaint that we received regarding single pilot operations in the DC-3 has been closed out with no action as there was not a regulatory deviation determined. Well, I have to ask, if there's no regulatory deviation, why didn't you know that before you sent out the LOI? That's kind of your job to know what's law and what is not law. Let's take a look at the next one. Here's his next reply here. Same thing on low passes. Same holds true for the low approach at any airport in any aircraft. See FAA letters of interpretation. Now, this is my writing. I said FAR regarding 9119. Again, it seems that you are under incentive to initiate complaints without knowing what you're talking about first. And he goes on to say, uh, again, uh, and it was closed, the complaint with no action as there was not a regulatory deviation determined during the investigation. 
So he sent out both of these, launching a big investigation only to close them. Still yet to this day, I haven't gotten official word that these are both closed. Um, the whole thing appears to be retaliatory in nature, and I think, I think this is FAA and NTSB trying to manufacture a way to take Dan out. That's really all this is. My conclusion to him in the latter part of the email, I said, I believe that your conduct may be a part of a concerted FAA retaliatory effort in the form of harassment for a specific purpose. The FAA has published guidelines on this, and there they are. He says, as stated in our phone call previously, we do not operate on a retaliatory basis at the FAA. I am a little confused as to what you believe this is in retaliation to. Would you be able to clarify this, please? Yes, I'm clarifying this. FAA told me to watch out, watch my back. They're after me. FAA and NTSB, they're definitely after me. And it has to do with initiation for these two women who had the engine failure at night and the fact that I got to talk to them first. I'm a little bit disappointed in this particular FISDO person originally. Uh, the language that he used was definitely discriminatory. It was definitely racist. He referred to them as stupid black girls on our phone call. And I... I don't think any of that's appropriate. I'm not going to do anything with it for the time being, but I think FAA needs to take an internal look at who they have, what they're saying, and what they're putting out there, and their steps. When you send out a letter of investigation, you should know exactly what you're talking about. In this case, I don't think that they do. You know, the whole drone world is just getting up to speed. I'm not a drone guy or a drone operator, but I have used multiple operators to help me capture nonprofit footage of the DC-3 and other airplanes using drone. Not very much, but we have on occasion. Here's a little bit of a clip of this. The question has come to play. Maybe you drone operators can tell me. Um, the question is, can you fly the drone near an operating airplane if you've made arrangements? If you have permission from the airport, you're operating near another airplane. That pilot is aware of it. You're aware of it. You've briefed and you have a radio. Can you fly the drone near another airplane as in what's being shown here is this footage that you're looking at right now is this legal or, ir or illegal i personally think the purpose of drone footage is to capture aerial footage of things that you that you can absolutely do safely and efficiently i don't see any problem with this footage that you're seeing right here well let's get down and talk to the, about some of the accidents you know we just had a spitfire accident a fatal in england just a couple of days ago um, this airplane, I'm going to show you the runway here, took off from this runway, ended up at about here, fatal accident, loss of thrust on takeoff, stalled the airplane, and this pilot is dead. I don't have any more information about it, but definitely um, mishandled. Look at all the open fields around here that this pilot could have gone into. A tragic, horrible loss of a pilot and an airplane. The sky bolt out in California just the other day. I'll put it on the screen here. This one ended up upside down, but the pilot's okay. He had an engine failure. He landed off field, flipped the airplane over, but he crawled out and he's totally fine. He handled his engine failure either en route. I'm not sure if it was on takeoff or it was en route. In any case, he did not stall his airplane. He landed it. It did flip over and he's, he was able to crawl out just fine. You know, there's been a lot of serious vision jet brake failures, a total of three. Here's a little bit of video footage of this vision jet going off the runway. Has to do with some kind of a brake valve failure in the Cirrus vision jet. I know very little about it. All I'm saying is it looks like this could be a trend here. There's been three of them in recent history. Loose braking on a Cirrus vision jet while taxiing and has, has caused runway excursions. I think we should probably keep an eye on this. If you're an operator of one of these airplanes, be cautious. I think this is a recurring, possibly could be a recurring problem. Be very careful out there. Here's some fantastic footage. I'm going to include this newscast. This couple had a rotat, a reduction of thrust. They said they lost the engine, but this propeller is definitely spinning. Look at this thing. I'm going to play the whole news clip here or the appropriate portion of it. They did make it back to the runway, but the guy elected to raise the gear to make it back. He elected to go for a belly landing. If he had put the gear down, he would not have made it. Look how close he is here. Check out this newscast. A remarkable emergency landing at Bankstown Airport this afternoon. A stricken aircraft skimming homes and other buildings after losing power. The couple on board telling Nine News they didn't think they were going to make it to the runway. Spotted by our news chopper, a small Cessna, two people on board. The pilot has lost all power. Mayday, mayday, Mac Yankee whiskey, engine problem. His aircraft is gliding, aiming for Bankstown Airport. 
He's only metres above homes. So low, he clips this tree. He just misses a service station, skims over two hangars before smacking into the runway, sliding and somehow missing other planes before stopping. Uh, he is on the ground. So far in the month of May, we've had 10 fatals, one as recently as yesterday. I'm going to put these on the screen here for you. This is May 2024. I'm going to go over a couple of these things. Uh, the A36 was the first one. We've already covered that in Augusta, Georgia. The AC690, this is the icing one. John Latham, age 63, in the state of Virginia. I'm also going to put another graphic on here. This has to do with an airplane I'm very familiar with. The twin commander is almost unrecoverable in a stall. I'm going to put this graphic up here, but there's, there's been four incidents here. Three were fatal. The one in Missouri here was flown by a friend of mine who stalled and spun his 690B. This was November 691. Whiskey Mike stalled it, spun it. He, he was able to recover it, although he bent the airplane. That airplane was entirely bent, almost trashed. They had to replace almost everything on the airplane to make it fly again. I know this pilot. I talked to him after it happened. Probably one of the scariest rides. Now this 691 Whiskey Mike, this airplane changed in numbers and it flew to South Carolina. It was involved in a fatal, the same end number. 691 Whiskey Mike was serial number 11,399. It was involved in a dual fatal from about 14,000 feet doing steep turns. They let this thing get slow. Both guys died. The one in California was also an icing DOMS. I believe this thing stalled and spun. Once you get these things into a spin, according to my friend, it is almost impossible to get it out. You're going to ride this thing all the way in. Uh, the other one, the last one here, was the one from uh, Virginia here that uh, uh, the an initial report is out on this thing. I can't tell exactly. They did say fire, but normally when the airplane snaps a wing off or something, a fire often erupts, so you can't really tell if the fire caused the crash or the spin over speed caused the fire. Don't know yet. And anyway, here's all four of them on the graphic here. Uh, the one in Missouri and the one in South Carolina are actually the exact same airplane. And I got the dates on here to show you uh, what that airplane did. It actually kept the same serial number, but changed in numbers, went to South Carolina, got involved in a second stall spin, only the second time it was not recoverable. The third one on the list, that's 241 Papa Mike. I inappropriately incorrectly referred to this as a tbm it was not this is another overspeed i do believe but this uh airplane we haven't found out if they found all four corners of the airplane at the site yet joseph bryant 72 years old um the next one we've talked about this out in montana gun hunting young hayden oakland age 19 uh was killed in this and so was the passenger and then 47 whiskey tango this is the uh, one in tennessee no disrespect intended to this family i'm just saying it's a forked tail doctor killer. You have to know what you're doing. You have to have a tremendous amount of experience and background to do this. The doctor took his two kids on this airplane. He went from a Piper to a V-35, a turbocharged V-35. Should have never occurred. He did not have the flight training, the background, and the experience to do it. We're very sorry. This is a lesson for all of us. I want you to know that the ride to the ground from in flight, when you snap a tail off a V-35, you're going to be alive all the way to impact. It is a horrific way to go. Don't do this. You should apply some common sense and prevention. If you know somebody out there operating an airplane that should not be operating an airplane like that, you need to be able to step up and tell them, this is what I think. I think you need to get some more training. And no, I will not board your airplane with you until you get a lot of experience and a lot of training in that particular airplane. The V-tail, some of these airplanes, I guess it doesn't really matter what it is. When you exceed the design load limit of any airplane, something is coming off the airplane. And we've had, this is now number four since January, in-flight breakups. Uh, it's a terrible way to go. Let's go on to the next one here. Uh, the next one on the list after that is the Cessna 150. This is John Monreal, age 18, out in, in uh, Texas. I have talked extensively with some people out there who reached out to me. I don't think this was a suicide. I think this has got caught in a very bad situation. He did drive it kind of hard into the ground, but... Um, the kid was a great kid. Uh, everybody liked him, and there was no hint of anything personal or emotional going on. I don't have a good explanation for this. I'm just very sorry for this family and the loss of young John. He had a bright aviation career and future ahead of him and planned. It was his dream to fly airplanes. I'm very, very sorry for this loss in Texas. 
The next one is the BC-12D up in Alaska. That's the water ski one. Dave Haggers don't have very much information about that other than a couple of people that did see the very last few minutes of that. November 99, Victor Yankee. This is in Virginia recently. Grover McCall, 66 years old, went out to do a test flight on a breezy and it did not go good. This sounds like the witnesses are saying stall spin. And then 2-2 Mike Whiskey. This is an extra 300L in Washington. 4.48 p.m. on the 19th. Jerry Reininger, 69 years old. I took the data and put this into uh, Google Earth so you can show the path here. This is the airport that he was going to, and he flew up this following the interstate up to this area. I'm not really sure why he climbed and turned right and stayed to the right of this thing when he could have just landed the airplane. In any case, the wreckage was found in this mountain range very, very close to the last data point uh, in thick woods and terrain. Um, no idea if weather played a factor or if he lost viz or if he went unconscious. I have no idea. A true loss for the community. Everybody that was out there knew Jerry, a well-respected guy, well-liked guy, and we're very sorry for that loss out there. Uh, at this point, completely unexplained. I'm, I'm at a loss to figure out what Jerry did or how he could have gotten that extra even from his position, even with an engine failure, all he had to do was turn left and land the airplane. He was home free. How could he end up out there, nose into that mountain with that kind of an impact? It just makes no sense. The very last one just happened, 446 Kilo Whiskey over the Gulf of Mexico. You talk about night, terrain, IMC and everything else. This guy, this guy, he was, he was uh, at night and IMC over the Gulf of Mexico. I think this is night spatial disorientation. Remember, he was fine while he was over land. As soon as he got over the Gulf of Mexico, now he is IMC. He went from night to both night and IMC at the same time. You can't tell. This is a spatial disorientation track. I have no idea if there was any other complicating factors like carbon monoxide or heart failure or anything like that. No way to know but he did not make it back. I don't even know at this point how many were on the airplane. I think one, but they're saying now that there might have been two people on the airplane. Just don't know yet. I'm going to talk real quick about Burley, the Cessna 208. I won't let this one go. I want you to say thank you for those of you who sent an email to the NTSB. Remember, it is their job to make recommendations. That illegal, unsafe approach is still out there today with the excessive rate of descent. Here's a picture of this thing. The profile on this thing, all they did was they unplugged the VASI so that they could theoretically make it legal. They put these smokestacks up. They weren't supposed to be there. And I want to tell you that, remember in the case of D.B. Cooper, uh, the cigarette butts from the D.B. Cooper original hijacking back in 1971, acquired by the FBI. There was a whole bunch of cigarette butts uh, allegedly smoked by the hijacker. Guess where they are today? Well, they're missing. FBI all of a sudden, the only evidence containing DNA, the only actual evidence, those cigarette butts are missing. What else is missing out there? The smokestack is missing. I went out there and I made sure I didn't steal the light. I made sure that the light was retained for safekeeping. And it is, it is in the hands of the plaintiff's attorneys. It is logged in and verified. I made sure that this, knowing full well, there's going to be a cover-up. There's going to be a bunch of scurrying. There's going to be a bunch of stuff goes missing very, very quickly. There's going to be a lawsuit. There's going to be all this stuff. NTSB has closed their investigation. They missed everything on this thing. They did not make any measurements. They didn't measure the stack. They have no idea what it, what the real deal was, and they still, to this day, have made no recommendation. The Texas thing, Charles Cook, the appeal has been filed. I'm very, very happy with that. My goal is someday to be at a deposition. There's about five people in Texas that need depositions to find out who was out there at the field that day, who propped that airplane over, who sent them out. My main question is that I would like to know, maybe you can tell me your answer, was Charles Cook there that day? Was he? I think the day is coming where Charles Cook's going to have to raise his right hand under deposition along with four other people and tell the story and answer the questions. The appeal is in process here. They didn't do anything correctly in this alleged default judgment. No wonder they got a default judgment. There wasn't anything proper about the whole thing. We're fixing to find out. All that's in progress, and I appreciate your help. I'm going to go over the schedule real quick. I'll be at EAA Chapter 22 in Rockford on June 4 for their EAA meeting. That's a Tuesday, I believe. I'll be up there. It's an evening cookout, dinner. Come on out. EAA Chapter 22. Uh, yes, Chapter 22 on June 4. Uh, June 15 is the fly-in in Hampton, Georgia. If you want to fly in, 
I won't be there on June 15th, but the DC3 will be, and I'll have people out there uh, with the DC3. If you want to talk to our DC3 people, they will be there. I'll be up in uh, KMZZ. Here's the graphic for that, doing another function in Indiana with my friend Jason Smoker. He's up there, and he's in charge of all that kind of thing. And then June 29th, I'll be in Texas with my friend Doc Williams. Doc and his wife will host me out there for another fantastic weekend, and I'm sure there will be uh, tacos and Mexican food in the mix and probably some banjos. I'll be speaking uh, at the donut thing Saturday morning in Texas, June 29th. Look forward to seeing you there. It's free. It's open to the public. I'd like for you to come out. I'll have a little bit of extra information to include about the entire Texas thing that I'm going to give in person while I'm out there just to make things interesting. I'll probably play the banjo and I look forward to seeing you out there. I'm going to include this last little clip again here from the people who survived the 210 crash in Australia. This is their interview. This is their culmination of their report here about staying alive and i want you to stay alive in your airplane for my tiny little itty bitty fledgling youtube channel dan grider probable cause what are you going to do to celebrate tonight nothing just uh, just be alive <laughs> <laughs> just be alive jake and karen thumbs up, Give me a thumbs up. the two luckiest people in sydney tonight interesting so in that regards, as far as training goes, like I said, I would go back to my original statement of uh, basically just making sure that you're complying with whatever the regulatory requirement is, of course, for the phase of flight and the operation you're conducting, and then conduct everything in accordance with POH and ASM limitations. 